when in reality, it's being denied and undermined. What does the Bible say about predestination? Well, the Bible certainly teaches that it's true. Predestination is basically the teaching that God selected you before you selected him. Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should bring forth much fruit. Often we'll use the phrase, well, you know, when I found the Lord, but the reality is God found you before you found him. Also, the Bible says that God has predestined us to be conformed into the image of his own dear son. You know, it's an interesting thing. A lot of times believers will get off on rabbit trails about how predestination takes place, who's predestined, who isn't predestined, and yet they'll lose sight of what the Bible says about predestination when it points out that you've been predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Instead of getting hung up on the hows and whys, why don't we focus on the purpose of predestination? God wants me to become more like Jesus. That's his goal and his purpose for me. Yet at the same time, I must balance this and say, the Bible also teaches the free will of man. There are many passages that tell us God has chosen us before we chose him, but there are also many passages that tell us we must choose God. You say, how do you reconcile the two? I don't. The fact of the matter is, in many cases, predestination and the teaching of free will are taught side by side in the same passage. Therefore, my emphasis is to appeal to people to believe in Jesus Christ. I'll leave the choosing up to God. But the main thing I want to focus on is rejoicing in the fact that because I've been predestined, I want to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is a perfect example of the various types of positions that men take in an effort to try and straddle the truth and to try to find some middle ground position that keeps everybody happy by using the words elect and predestined and by teaching them as they plainly appear in scripture and then completely undermining them in the very next breath by misinterpreting other areas of scripture to make it sound like God's will and man's free choice are somehow in competition with one another. But by teaching election and God's sovereignty in that kind of context, where it's nullified by everything that is said afterwards, well, it virtually castrates the true meaning of those doctrines. And any real value that term election has in its original context is hopelessly lost in a sea of absolute flat-out contradictions. The kinds of contradictions that confuse sincere believers, give ground to unbelievers to mock Christianity, and that rob God of his glory. And you know what ends up happening is that to any honest observer, God's election in those scenarios is so diluted that God's really not electing anybody, at least not in the full biblical sense. That's why, lest there be any confusion about exactly what I'm saying, I'd like to define for you what Scripture means when it says that God elects men to eternal life. First of all, when God states in the Bible that He elects men to eternal life, He actually means He elects men to eternal life. So what I'm saying is the Bible clearly teaches that He chooses some, not all. And before you get too nervous that this somehow makes me out to be a hyper-Calvinist, that it somehow makes God out to be an elitist ogre. Let me state that over the course of this special mini-series, we're going to see a mountain of scriptural evidence that both proves the point of absolute election and greatly reconciles it with God's love and sense of justice. And because of time constraints, the scriptural evidence that we'll be presenting is, is only a minuscule fraction of what is available. You know, there's a great saying in the Latin language that goes like this, quod volumus facile credimus, which translated means, what we wish, we readily believe. And that's very often the case with why some people, even Christians, are willing to believe certain doctrines and teachings that simply aren't biblical or true. They, in essence, believe what they want to believe instead of what really is. And that's certainly the case when it comes to this subject of election.
So, as I've already mentioned, I like to define the words that we use right up front so that there's no confusion or debate over their meaning. And if I didn't know better, I would think that it would be almost unnecessary to define the terms elect or chosen because they seem like pretty self-explanatory terms. One would think that it would be difficult to debate words with such plain meanings. I mean, they really are fairly basic words. And when they're used in scripture, they aren't used any differently. They're still used in very straightforward ways. But, as evidenced by the controversies that spring up concerning this subject, well, it's apparent that clear, easily definable words are no barrier to people misinterpreting biblical doctrines. So I want to make this as clear as possible. So, in order to understand this biblical term election, let me start by asking you a question that will hopefully help you to see that the biblical term elect isn't something we need to be afraid of or intimidated by. Here's the question. What do you do when you elect a mayor, for example? You select him out of a group of other candidates, correct? Well, that's all the term elect means in scripture as well. It means that someone, in this case God, selects or makes a choice of one or more humans out of a greater number. But here's the thing about how the Bible uses that term. The problem isn't usually in admitting that God selects or elects some people to eternal life, because no one who has read the Bible all the way through and has paid any attention at all can deny it. Scripture says plainly, for example, that so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace and if by grace then it is no longer by works if it were grace would no longer be grace what then what israel sought so earnestly it did not obtain but the elect did the others were hardened as it is written god gave them a spirit of stupor eyes so they could not see and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. So the problem isn't really admitting that Scripture teaches that God selects some and not others for eternal life, because it obviously does. The problem comes in submitting to that truth and just leaving it alone. People don't like it, so they feel the need to tinker with it, to change it, or to do something that they call balancing it with other biblical truths. Yet at the same time, I must balance this and say, the Bible also teaches the free will of man. There are many passages that tell us God has chosen us before we chose him, but there are also many passages that tell us we must choose God. Which really is to undermine and dilute it. You say, how do you reconcile the two? I don't. The fact of the matter is, in many cases, predestination and the teaching of free will are taught side by side in the same passage. And that is what really is at the core of a lot of the errors surrounding the doctrine of election. When some people run across that word elect in the Bible, they get worried about the apparent contradiction that concept has with other biblical doctrines. Doctrines like the one that teaches about God's love for the whole world and not just certain parts of it or doctrines that teach man's responsibility to choose Christ and to be accountable for his own sin, and so on. And so they try and reconcile those apparent contradictions. And the way that they try to do that is by going outside of biblical boundaries and minimizing election. And they either change its fundamental meaning or they change what God elects people to. So they might use a philosophical human argument, for example, like saying something like, God peers into the future with his omniscience and that he picks or elects those he knows who will pick him. And then they call that election. Well, forgetting for the moment that such a theory appears nowhere in scripture, let's just use our common sense to think that one through a bit. In a government election, when you elect or choose your candidate, out of the rest of the candidates. Do you first wait to see if he chose you? No, of course not. That would be silly and meaningless. You choose him. Election, even in that illustration, is a pretty straightforward concept. And so it is when God elects men. It's simple to see what he means. 
he chooses or selects one or more out of a greater number. And he doesn't peer into the future to see who will pick him, as some try to rationalize. That would be omniscience, not election. And if that's what God really did, it would only serve to render his choice completely unnecessary. There would be no need for God to pick because those people who picked him would automatically be saved by their own choice anyway. So his choice would be rendered meaningless. Listen, this, this is not super advanced theology that only scholars can grasp. To elect is to choose one or more out of a larger group. That's it. It's not a mystery. And the plain meaning and use of that word does not vary in Scripture either. So that much, at least, if we're being intellectually and morally honest with ourselves, is hard to argue with. Elect or chosen in the Bible always means just that, elect or chosen. But the Bible makes the concept of election even clearer to us by referring to God's elect or his chosen people as, quote, a peculiar people. A reference not to the fact that we're oddballs, although I suppose in a sense we really are, but that we're personally and distinctly set apart from the rest of mankind. In other words, the idea of being elect carries with it the idea that some people are personally selected and specifically and distinctly set apart from the larger group of humanity for special purposes that God himself has always had in mind since before the world was ever made. We are his peculiar people. Peculiar, it's a word and a concept that is truly simple enough for a child to grasp. And yet, our human biases and prejudices, at times at least, cause some people to miss that profound yet very simple truth in God's Word, even when God's Word uses that very phrase, peculiar people. But before I comment on that further, let me just prove my point, that we all, at heart, understand this concept of peculiarity. I've got a package of children's markers. So, which one's peculiar? It's not hard to tell, is it? But let me just point out, each marker is different. Each one, for example, is a different color. And yet, even though that's true, it's also true that each one is fundamentally the same. They're all children's markers. And yet, despite those similarities and those differences, there is still only one that is peculiar, unique, special, different from all the rest. Well, so it is with God's peculiar people. It's not a very difficult concept. And so it's that very simple truth that I want you to stop and consider. I want you to look at just one of the many verses in Holy Scripture that uses that term peculiar. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And in order to fully appreciate the depth and the scope of that verse as it pertains to God's chosen people, let's read it together in context, beginning in verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. A peculiar people, chosen by God. Oh, it's a phrase when it's used in scripture that 